Okay, welcome everyone. So still nobody here for the fashion, it's in the other room. No, we're all here to talk about economics. Um, so this uh, is a program in the series of, of New Economy. And we have um, um, two very interesting economists here, uh, Steve Keen, who came all the way from Australia, and uh, uh, Theo Kocke. Um, they're both professors, and they know a lot about the economy. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and to go in a discussion with them and to answer this question, can we avoid another crisis? So who of you think that we can avoid another crisis? Okay. There's a few optimists here. So who thinks we're going to head straight into another crisis? Okay. So most of you are here because you're very worried. You'd like to have some answers what to do. So we can't avoid it anymore, but you want to know what, what you should do to survive. Okay. Um, 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 who, who has another question that he would really like to have answered at, at the end of, of this discussion? Who, who wants to ask another question apart from, which is in line with this one, but is, is a little more specific? Yeah? Somebody. Okay. We have somebody here. That's easy. Yeah, so I want to add... Oh, well, uh, my name is Martin. I'm from Rethinking Economics. And uh, my question I is just, uh, like, are, are there any macroeconomic stabilizers which could possibly av uh, help us avoid another crisis in general, considering... Uh, some structural reasons behind why crises happen in the first place, specifically the tendency for the rate of profit to fall? Uh, I'll take you on on that one. Okay. <laughs> That's quite a, <laughs> quite a question. So, you remember it, Steve? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're going we're gonna to talk about that a uh, little later. So, can I have a warm welcome for Steve Keen? Well, Steve, w wait a minute. I have, a, I have one of your books here. Ah. It's, a, it's a comics book. So you think Steve is just writing difficult papers, ac an ac academic paper, but, but he actually wrote a comic book. I didn't draw it. I'm not that <laughs> talented. And it starts with an apology to the planet on behalf of an accidental profession, economics. Mm. So why did you write this? Um, the actual story behind that, article was I was flying to a conference in Canada and I was reading a paper by Larry Summers. You've all seen the name Larry Summers? And uh, Larry has, has a record for arrogance that's probably unsurpassed on the planet. And this brand new paper uh, had a term he called the, what's it called? The, um, it's not Nehru, this one is the um, Feirir, F-E-R-I-R, -R, Full Employment Real Interest Rate. Now, this term had never been used in economics before, and in this one article, it's used 23 times. And I'm reading the damn thing and thinking, he's talking like some bloody particle physicist who discovered a new particle, and he wants to um, you know, justify it. So that, that's, was the, that was the, the motive for writing the entire um, cartoon book, sending up them as being like particle physicists, and what they're discovering are imaginary particles. Don't exist in the real world, and they waste people's time. Uh, both talking about it, uh, making policy on it, and sending students to do PhDs to discover things that don't exist. But the Ricardo bit was uh, the preface to the whole thing. And uh, the joke I made, and it's actually got some seriousness to it, is that economics is based on a set of fallacies, massive fallacies. And one of the first fallacies came from David Ricardo. But the amusing thing about David Ricardo is that he, uh, he, he was actually, you, you all know the Battle of Waterloo. You remember that? Okay. Um, there's a famous tale involving uh, a stockbroker who had a runner at the Battle of Waterloo watching and seeing who won, racing across the, you know, Belgium to get on a boat to England to report to the British Stock Exchange what actually happened, who won. And he reported to this stockbroker and he walked out onto the stage of the... Um, the stock exchange, and she went, sell! And everybody panics. Britain must have lost. Massive sale. Prices crash. And then David Ricardo then says, buy. He made something of the order of several million pounds at the time. 
out of that. So he was a con man. So one of the leading people who's seen as founding economics is actually a con man. Because he, he r later wrote a famous book, right? Yeah, Principles of Political Economy and, and Taxation. And that's still quite influential on economics today. Yeah, and they, they, every, they want to glamorize any stupid idea they have where they come up and call it Ricardian. <laughs> well, Steve, you, you prepared um, a presentation. So we're going to listen to that. It's, I already saw the presentation. It's quite difficult, I think, and, and, and I know the, the, the material. So try to explain it as, as simple as you can. And, and if I don't understand it, I'll ask you a question in between, okay? Okay, I'm you'll shake your head. Here. Well, I know I'm doing the, wrong, <laughs> doing the wrong thing. Okay, look at the slides rolling there. Let's see. Okay. That's my, that's my two websites. I'm now an independent scholar supported by crowdfunding. That's the first thing to mention there. So if you, this, this is actually an extract from a, a movie, a documentary that Theo has done called Boom Bus Boom. Um, because and it's, a, it's a beautiful job here of showing that politicians, prior to the major crises that existed in our lifetimes, the Great Depression and what they, the Americans call the Great Recession, what Australians call the global financial crisis, their economists were assuring them the next year was going to be absolutely fantastic, get out there in front of the media and take credit for it. So here's the first of those. In 1928, Volume? President Calvin Coolidge gave his State of the Union address in the following terms. In the domestic field, there is tranquility and contentment, and the highest record of years of prosperity. The great wealth created by our enterprises and industry and saved by our economy has had the widest distribution among our own people. The country can regard the present with satisfaction and anticipate the future with optimism. 1928. He didn't know what we know now, that the United States was about to suffer the worst economic disaster in its then history. Our economy is healthy and vigorous and growing faster than other major industrialized nations. The American people have turned in an economic performance that is the envy of the world. He didn't know what we know now, that the worst crisis ever to hit the Western economies was just around the corner. So, rather than walking into a crisis like that, wouldn't it be good to have some data that can actually warn us this is about to happen? And this is looking at the level of private debt and credit in America. I wrote the right button, let's see. There's the boom and bust that we went through that inspired Theo's documentary. There's the Great Depression. There's another little thing called the panic of 1837. And I'll explain what the blue line is, I think, in the next slide. But this, this, this is the level of debt, the amount of dollars owed by American, American private sector to American banks. And this is the rate of change of that. So I call this debt and that credit. And notice that during the crisis here, and the crisis here, and the crisis here, credit's massively negative. Minus 10% of GDP back in 1837. Again, minus 10 through the Great Depression, and minus 5 this time round. So I think there's indicators. And when you take a look at that credit and then say, how does it correlate to other economic variables that we normally focus upon, like the unemployment rate? Is anybody here old enough to have done a Rorschach test? In the psychology test where you push two pieces of blotted paper together and you get a crazy pattern and you're supposed to say it's about sex or something of that nature? Well, this, these are two data series that, according to conventional economics, should have no correlation with each other. And they virtually look like a Rorschach plot. One goes up, the other goes down. So one is credit, the rate of change of private debt. The other is unemployment. And the correlation is minus 0.85. 
Now, if you read Ben Bernanke, of course, who was running the Federal Reserve at the time, he said there should be effectively no significant relationship between those two. Do you think he would have checked it? He hasn't. We also know that the household, the, the housing market went for a boom and a bust and then another, another boom is starting again in America. So what I'm looking here is change in household credit and change in house prices. Pretty obvious, isn't it? Okay. The correlation there is 0.71. So in one case, credit goes up, unemployment goes down, and the other, credit changes, house prices change in the same direction. And it's overwhelmingly powerful data. I, when I, I, this is data that comes out of the, some of the theoretical work that I do. And when I was presenting this to my students in classes, I would say, and I literally mean it, if I was trying to make my case and had to invent data to fit it, I wouldn't dare make up stuff as obvious as the actual data. Okay? It's overwhelmingly strong that this is the case. It's so bloody obvious. You know? Why do they do nothing about it? Well, it comes down to they have a theory in which, this plays, in which credit plays no role, which banks, debt and money don't matter. And it's a textbook model and Nobel Prize winning Paul Krugman I call it the Fobel Prize, as in faux. It's not actually a real Nobel Prize. Uh, writing a book called Endless Depression Now, talking about this model and how he applies it to thinking about banking, said, think of it this way. When debt's rising, it's not the economy as a whole borrowing more money. It's simply patient, impatient people borrowing from patient people. So there's no relationship between debt and money in his model of how the banking sector operates. And if you look at a textbook, and who's suffered through an economics degree here? <laughs> hey! <laughs> <laughs> I might have to start believing in a deity after that. <laughs> I should have sent that to the tweet of God. That's very appropriate. Yeah? Um, it says that there's Banks just, are, I call it this the Ashley Madison theory of banking. Okay, banks then actually do something to you. They introduce you to somebody else who's willing to do it and they, you, charge, they, you pay them a fee for the introduction. So what they say is um, banks are just intermediaries. That's the phrase they use all the time, intermediaries between savers and borrowers. And in the end, they don't change what they call the model lo of loanable funds. They don't create demand out of thin, thin air. They just link lenders to savers. That's all they really do. So it's like they're, they're part of the plumbing, but somebody else has to turn the tap. So they don't really matter. You can ignore banks, you can ignore private debt, you can ignore money when you model the financial system. And this is the, the textbook argument that individuals lend their savings to investors uh, or they deposit their savings in a bank and the bank makes a loan for you. So effectively, when the bank makes a loan, it's lending on your behalf, which means the loan is your asset, not the bank's asset. That's the thinking that goes on there. Now, I, I use a soft, I've designed a software package I called Minsky. I didn't write the, the code, but I designed the actual interface and the technology behind it. Thank you again, God. Um, for double entry bookkeeping. A and <laughs> this hasn't happened in Amsterdam before. Um, <laughs> what I show is this actual idea that there's a, a patient agent who produces consumer goods who's lending money to an impatient agent who produces investment goods. And the bank then charges a fee to, to finance the whole thing. So if you, any accountants in the room? No thunder that time. Good, okay. Um, so accountants would be familiar with this. You show everybody having assets, liabilities, and equity, and the sum of the three, of the assets minus liabilities, minus equity is necessarily zero. That's the idea of double entry bookkeeping, so you make sure every flow goes somewhere and ends up somewhere and you don't make any mathematical errors unless your boss actually wants you to. Uh, so what I have is a consumer agent lends from their bank account to the investment account. Uh, the investment company pays interest because of the loans that are outstanding. When repayment goes on, there's money transferred back and the consumer pays a fee to the bank and that's how the bank makes money. That's the mental model that uh, mainstream economists have of banks, which is why they ignore them. And when I play with this model, and I'll show you a simulation shortly of, of running the model, um, I make dramatic changes to the rate at which loans are made, dramatic changes to how fast loans are repaid. Whenever there's an increase in lending, there's a fall in the rate of growth. When you repay, there's a spike in the rate of growth, but overall nothing much happens 
to GDP over, I think, about 200 years worth of simulation time here. And there's a dramatic increase in the debt ratio and a fall, nothing much happening in the economy. So if their model was accurate, they'd be right to ignore the role of banks. Now, I'm going to run a simulation here to see if this works. Loanable funds, and if I run the model, I get, as you can see, a growth rate of zero, GDP flatlining at 200, increasing level of debt, and no change in the amount of money in the economy. And if I speed up lending, watch growth rate, you'll see the growth rate actually declines temporarily. And then if I slow down repayment, it drops again. So I have a rising level of debt to GDP. Debt now at C gives the money stock. GDP is still effectively flatlining at 200. Uh, if I now go in the opposite direction and speed up repayment, the economy booms and slow down uh, lending, booms even more. Uh, go back to the initial position and stop that. And that pretty much shows that if the neoclassicals were correct and banks were just intermediaries. You could completely ignore the level of debt, uh, private debt, because rising private debt has very little effect on the economy. Now let's go to the real world. And all that involves doing is going to the godly tables of the bank and the consumer sector and saying, well, it's not true that the banks are intermediaries. They actually originate debt. So I'm going to delete the debt column as an asset of the consumer sector get rid of the financial operations shown there, come over to the bank's view, there's now an unallocated liability because I still have the investment sector owing debt. So click on the down arrow, that shows me an existing asset which is not currently uh, allocated. Uh, the Minxie brings across the operations of lending and repayment. I simply have to say, well, interest is paid to the bank and the bank fee, let's just get rid of that. And I have made no other changes to the model and if I now go and simulate it again from the beginning with the same levels, positive growth rate, growing level of GDP, increasing debt causes increasing amount of money in the economy. If you increase the rate of lending, the economy goes into a bit of a boom. Did over repayment slows down. Pardon me, I went the wrong way there. Uh, and then if I go back and say, well, let's have an increase in the rate of repayment and a slowdown in lending, and my God, you have a recession. That is the difference between loanable funds and the real world, and it's why we should throw loanable funds as a model on the scrap heap of history. So the reason they couldn't see a crisis coming is they have a model which rules out the possibility of it. And it, all you have to do is say, let's be realistic and say what the structure of the banking sector actually is, and you can see what's going to cause a crisis, what's going to cause a boom and cause a crisis afterwards. So it's that pathetic in that sense. Economics... I see it as a pathetic discipline, which has a, a mythical set of ideas in its mind that mean that they're the worst people you could possibly choose to tell you how to manage the economy. That's why they didn't see the crisis coming. That's why they had no idea of how to cure it after it happened. That's why we're still in stagnation after the whole thing. So that's just repeating that particular diagram. It's all it takes, 30 seconds, I can go from their mythical model to the real world or the stylized version of the real world and show how wrong they are. Now, when you then take another look at this data and say, well, let's just see just how, how significant this information is. Again, that's the same data I showed you beforehand, the credit, the rate of change of private debt, but I'm now just using it on the vertical axis rather than having the debt level as well. So the peak is 20% of GDP as the level of credit, the bottom is minus 10. And you take a look at the panic of 1837 and the change in credit-based demand from the peak of the boom before the crisis to the depth of the crisis itself was minus 21% of GDP. That's pretty big. Okay? Nothing else changes as fast as credit in a capitalist economy. During the Great Depression, minus 18%. And why was our last crisis so big, even though it wasn't as deep and as sustained? The reason is, we've got a couple of late guests here, so two chairs over here for you. <laughs> okay. Um, was minus 21%. So the same scale as the Panic of 1837, less impact because of the size of the government sector, which I haven't actually covered uh, in this set of slides. So that's what caused the last crisis. It's bleedingly obvious when you look at the data properly. So my question now is, and I'm, I saw all the hands going up, are we going to have another crisis? Um, we're not going to have a crisis like 2008. The reason being the, the debt after the financial crisis is still huge, 
and a bit like if you'd climbed to the top of Mount Everest and then you've walked down to base station again, you're not going to climb up as quickly again as you did the first time. Okay? You're already at a very high level of debt. It's like you've got a ball and chain around your legs because your boom is starting from a very high level of debt. So if you look at the, the crisis uh, today in America, or the, the economy is today in America, credit is running at about 7% of GDP. It was 15% before the crisis began. This is just focusing now on the last 50 years. And you can see that there was a period of ups and downs in credit, quite dramatic rises. This is the, this, the uh, 1991 recession, the one that led to Bill Clinton becoming president because his message was, it's the economy, stupid. He wasn't smart enough to know what actually caused the problem, but he had a good slogan. Um, so the credit-based demand went from 2% of GDP, and this is the internet bubble, the dot-com bubble, and finally the subprime. Each of them boosting the rate of growth of, of, of private debt, leading that high level of private debt. Then you had the crash from 15% to minus 5%. Now after it, it's running at, a, as you can see, pretty much the, the, the bottom level, average to bottom, of the last 50 years. So it's a bit a bit like to have a big credit crisis, you've got to have a big credit boom at the beginning of it. Because it's a small credit boom right now, there'll be a slump, or there'll be stagnation, but there won't be a huge crunch like 2008. What about you lot? Okay. <coughs> right, well, you've got some strange data here. This is uh, looking at private debt and credit in the Netherlands. And you've been pretty much for 50 years just getting more and more indebted until about five years after the financial crisis, and it's slowly starting to decline now. And you look at your credit-based demand, it was actually higher, that, that's 20% of GDP, that's 5% higher than America at its peak. This is about 22%. Uh, you've had some slumps, but you've never had negative credit until a tiny bit after the crisis. You're now running close to, close to zero credit-based demand. So that, to me, implies not a huge crash, because you, if, you're, if you're plus 20, at this point, I'd be saying you're facing a crisis at some point. Because you're pretty much zero, you're facing a slump, a slowdown, but you're not facing a massive crisis like 2008. Now, when I take a look at the breakup of debt, that's also very different to the American. The American uh, economy was very heavily driven by household debt. And I regard household debt as much more dangerous, much more worrisome than corporate debt, because at least corporations can actually use that borrowed money to build factories. Okay? You you can't use the borrowed money to, to, to uh, sell your kids, <laughs> though some of you might be tempted occasionally. Um, so if you look at the level of corporate debt, that is far higher than America. In fact, corporate debt in the Netherlands is higher than the total of private debt in America. Okay? Household debt peaked way back in 2010 has been coming down. And the, the, what the Maastricht Treaty and the European Union obsess about government debt is actually you're one of the few countries that are actually below the Maastricht level. And that's not a problem anyway. Well, I'm happy to talk about it in question time later. Uh, when I take a look at the relationships that I've shown you beforehand about credit and un unemployment, you saw how strong that you know, the Rorschach test plot I showed you earlier for America. They don't know Rorschach test. That's a mess. But if you look at it, you get a, you get a minor correlation between unemployment and credit. But I think predominantly your economy is dominated by your exports. You've got a very high current account surplus. And that is where a lot of the what would otherwise be credit-based demand comes from. So it's more your external sector that dominates your economy than the, the credit sector. But you still do have an enormous level of private debt. So there is an issue there in terms of stagnation out of servicing that debt at some point. If I take a look at house prices, this is the same relationship. Again, you saw how strong that, that 0.71 correlation was for America. It's about 0.4 for Holland the Netherlands, whatever you prefer to be called these days. Um, so it's still there, and you've had a boom and a bust in your house prices, a bust, a boom leading up to uh, 2000, a bust after that. You actually had falling house prices before the Americans. Now a bit of a boom, but turning around. The odds are house prices are going to continue going down. There's been a boom, I know, a rise for a short while, but I, again, that data to me says not much happening with house prices, certainly nothing on the scale of the American situation. The rest of the planet, well, fortunately, I can point out some countries that will have a crisis, and one of them has to be the one that I've escaped from, <coughs> Australia. This is looking at our correlation, which is more in the line with the American correlation with between credit and unemployment. 
So there's been a, a credit-driven boom in the economy, and Australia's had positive credit, which is the, uh, except back in the 1990s, they had a recession, they blame on a, on a, a uh, prime minister at the time, Paul Keating, but huge positive credit. They managed to stop the going negative back in the financial crisis, but they're likely to go down now, and they've got a significant level of credit-based demand. So I see them as having a problem, and that applies to their housing bubble as well. Uh, one thing which Australia is famous for is house prices always rising. I get the same effective correlation for the house prices that I get in America, I get for Australia as well. So again, it's all driven by credit, and I can think that's going to come a cropper, and they'll um, have a problem coming up in the next one or two years. So the, back to the start of the presentation, the real problem we have in economics is economists don't understand the economy. We need a new economics. That's why students are talking about rethinking economics is vitally necessary because we have a theory, like the, as I showed you the idea about loanable funds, is so wrong about how banks operate and yet that's what guides the policy of organisations like the ECB. So you've got a ship of fools. The people on the steering wheel don't understand how boats work and that's the real dilemma we face and that's why I'm campaigning for a new economics and happy to take the question on rethinking economics shortly. And what, what they tend to do, they, they talk about making simplifying assumptions. And there's a, a, a great joke I was actually first told by a nuclear physicist. Uh, it's called the can opener joke. Has anybody heard the can opener joke? You haven't, okay. A chemist, a physicist and an economist get wrecked on a desert island. And the only thing that survives the, the boat getting crashed is a container full of baked beans, cans of baked beans. And the chemist says, well, I can, we can grab those fronds over there and I can calculate the temperature at which the cans will explode. And the physicist says, well, if you do that, I can calculate the trajectory of the beans so we can catch them. And the economist says, hang on, guys, you're doing, you're doing it far too hard. Let's assume we have a can opener. <laughs> and they, they claim they're simplifying assumptions. Here's a couple of simplifying assumptions. You've heard of, have you heard of what's called the efficient markets hypothesis? Lucky people you haven't, okay. This is the theory that determines how financial advisors tell you to manage your money. And the guy who developed the theory built this elaborate explanation of how a single individual would decide whether to allocate money to shares or bonds. But then he struck with the dilemma. How does he aggregate from one individual to everybody? Well, he says, I simply assume homogeneity of investor expectations. Investors are assumed to agree on the prospects of various investments. So you've never had a dinner party conversation about shares before because you all agree about what every company is going to do. Why would you talk about something where you all agree? And not only that, not only do you agree, you're right. So the efficient markets hypothesis presumes you, can, you actually can accurately predict what's going to happen to every company. That's an essential part of the theory. They don't teach that in the textbooks. You've got to dive into the actual articles and see which, frankly, intellectual garbage uh, this is based on. Now, this is one of my favourites. This is a guy who, again, tried to work out whether they could get the, a market demand curve. This, you know the, the intersecting line, supply and demand? You've all seen that? Well, they wanted to prove a market demand curve slopes down. And they went through the mathematics and found even if they started with individuals who, according to their theory, had downward sloping curves, so price rises, demand falls, even if you start with everybody having that as characteristics, when you aggregate, the market demand curve can have any shape at all. Now his way of getting around that problem was to make a set of assumptions which literally amount to this. An extra unit of purchasing power should be spent in the same way no matter to whom it is given. So if Bill Gates is walking through a railway and sees a homeless person, th throws a few dollars that way, that homeless person is going to buy Leonardo da Vinci's coda. And if the homeless person gives Bill Gates some money, Bill Gates is going to buy some alcohol. It's a stupid assumption. It's not a simplifying, it's a fantasy, it's a myth. But this is what they do all the time. Now the worst they've done is actually in terms of climate change. That's the main fair area I'm focusing on these days. And I was truly horrified by what I read when I was reading these so-called economists on climate change and a little story involving my partner who um, brought me a, a drink as, as middle as I was reading this material and she saw me with my head in my hands like this and said to me, what's wrong? And I said, I'm reading about climate change. She said, why are you reading that stuff? I said, because I'm writing a book on it. She said, why are you writing a book on climate change? Nobody wants to read that stuff. You can't do anything. If we die, we die. 
Can I have you say that's completely accurate? No argument. I cannot take on that argument at all. I'm still going to fight. But the reason economists are saying climate change doesn't matter is they make the assumption that the variation in climate we see, climate and GDP, we see across countries in, in, in one country, like if Utrecht has a higher income than Amsterdam and a two degree temperature difference, we can use that to predict what's going to happen with climate change. That is garbage. They have no idea of what climate change actually is. So the next big crisis will be ecological, not financial. And economists were just as guilty of that crisis as they were for the last one. And I'll leave it to that. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> so, there's a lot wrong with with economics. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of false theories in there. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. Um, I, I want to ask you a few questions about what you. Uh, let's w let's wait. Uh, can you sit on that side yeah, so I can? Uh, that's that's better. Um, so. Because I want to ask you a few questions, because, because I'm sure not everybody understood that. Uh, my mom is in here as well, and I'm sure she didn't understand everything mom? you said. Mom, did, did you understand that? everything? Not, not really, huh? No, I'm sure. So I want to ask you a few questions about um, what you just explained. And so I'm, I'm going to summarize what I understood from it. Um, so there's a theory of banking yeah. in which um, a saver brings money to the bank and the bank lends out that money to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that is the theory which is incorporated in many economic models. Yep. So that means that there is no increase in the amount of money in the economy if somebody takes out a loan. No, that's right, yeah. And that model is wrong. Yep. So how does it actually work? Okay. Uh, this mic is on, or? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, it's, it's quite simple, there's double entry bookkeeping. Uh, if you go to a bank and say, I want to buy a property in Amsterdam, and they'll, they say, that it'll cost you 600,000 euro, and they say, that, you know, I think we think it's a good idea, here's 600,000 euro, they put that in your deposit account, they, uh, I record an identical amount as a debt you owe to the bank. So they increase their assets by putting 600,000, just typing it into a spreadsheet, they increase your, their liabilities to you because they've given you 600,000, you then use that to buy the by the bank, by the pr property. So it's simply accounting, that's what they're doing. They don't actually lend out existing money, they're not a warehouse for money, they're a factory for money. But they're a factory to make money, they've got to create debt exactly the same amount. So think about banks as factories, not warehouses, and you'll have a better idea of how they function. Okay, so every, every time somebody takes out a loan, there's an increase in the amount of money in the economy. Yep. And that's also why if, if cr a credit is growing, Yeah then that's good for the economy. There's a lot of money going around uh, for yeah. a short period you, of you time. You can lend too much, and that's what, what happened with the financial crisis. And that's the other rather more mathematical slides that I stopped presenting a moment ago explain that. But fundamentally, rising credit gives you a rising boom. But because the credit comes with debt, it's a bit like you're getting a stimulus from the money you spend, but you're getting a, a ball and chain around your feet at the same time because the extra credit is change in debt. If the debt is growing faster than GDP, that's slowing down your capacity to grow. And ultimately, you get stagnation because there's so much debt outstanding, nobody wants to spend it all. People spend more slowly, the economy slows down, they stop borrowing, credit turns negative, and that's what gives us a financial crisis. Okay, that's quite clear. Um, does anybody else have a question about what Steve just told? Uh, wait, wait a minute. So I'm, I'm going to go around with the mic because then it's on the recording as well. Hi, my name is Tim. Uh, what's the uh, role of uh, demography on your uh, model? Democracy? D d demography. Demography. Dem oh, okay. Demographics. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm not really including demography in there. Uh, if you do, then of course you get things like the baby boomer period. Uh, where you know that gives you a huge increase in both workforce and and demand. Everybody needs uh, when you have a growing population. This was a large part of Japan's success uh, after the Second World War. Uh, the growing everybody needs a refrigerator. Everybody needs a washing machine. 
So you have huge demand coming out of that alone. And then in this, after the Second World War, again, I could go back and show those early charts. A major thing the Second World War did wasn't so much demography. We, we know the, the baby Burma effect. But it also massively reduced the level of private debt because everybody was on rations. You couldn't spend anything. And you were, if you are in the army, you didn't spend anything. You were being fed by the army. The paycheck was just building up in your account. If you were General Motors, you were making tanks rather than cars and the government was paying for them. So that meant that just a huge reduction in private debt occurred during the Second World War. So when you began the post-war period, as well as having this huge population surge after the Second World War, you also had incredibly low levels of debt. So high levels of credit stimulated demand without being much of a drag on the economy. Now we've got to the far end, courtesy of the baby boomers, and I happy to be, I'm happy to be a trader to my age group, by the way. Um, that that's that has given us this huge increase in debt as well as the demographic bubble now of course we face declining uh, but that shouldn't be a problem if you think about the technological capabilities we've built up in the last century we should be replacing workers with machines we should be sharing the capacity of our machines to produce output so it's not so much the lo loss of a labor force means you can't produce output it's the distribution of income that means that money goes to the owners of machines not to the people who work with them so it's more, it more, you see more of an income distribution issue than demographic. Well, I'd like to um, uh, welcome uh, Theo Kokke on stage. Applause, please. Yeah. Yeah. So, Theo, um, you're um, a professor at the VU, and you also um, have your own company, Cardano. It's uh, specialized in risk management. But you also made a movie about financial crisis, and it's called Boom Bust Boom. We're going to watch a clip soon, but I, I first want to know, why did you make this movie? Um, does this work? Yep. Looks like it, yeah. So, yeah, I made this movie because um, already in the mid-90s, I got frustrated that I, I spent a few years doing econometrics when I was young. You know, that's uh, something that economic, but then worse. Even they, they only make assumptions about mathematics and then <coughs> you only have to do the mathematics and, and you get your degree. Um, and um, so when I started to work, um, it turned out that this whole econometrics didn't work at all in practice. I became a risk manager. Um, sounds very boring. Uh, it's probably boring, but I like it. And, um, and then I, I said to, uh, so I, I started to work in emerging markets in, uh, at ING because they did a lot in, in South America and the Philippines. And I saw every time again in emerging markets, things went up very slowly and everybody became overconfident and very, very euphoric and, and happy. And all the money flew into these countries, massive amounts of money. And then you looked into these countries and you saw that their reserves were going down and there were higher uh, debt levels and there were uh, lots of things going wrong and inflation was much higher than other than the dollar, but the currency were, were packed. And I thought, these things don't work. And, and so we started to do all kind of other things, like looking underlying the economy and, and, and doing just common sense, at least like you would do if you hadn't done econometrics. And, um, and then we made scenarios about these things and, 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 and we, we learned what the real risks were. But then in the 90s, everybody started to say, no, 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 you have to follow these efficient portfolio theories that he was talking about. Yeah. You have to follow the uh, statistics of the markets, and if the markets become very low volatility, very calm, then that's a sign that risk is low. And I said that ING, but even at the central bank, I went to the central bank, I said, but this is not how it works in practice. If, if these volatilities become very low and markets are very calm because of higher debt and other things, often risk is extremely high. And you have to look at it at a different way, underlying the economy and look at all the aspects of what's happening in, in, in debt levels and in other things in the economy. And they said, no, 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 you have to do these statistics and you're very good at statistics to go back to your room, play the nerd and, and stay there. So this was the most, I went to the Dutch Central Bank, to the regulator, say this, these models are dangerous. And they said, no, you have to use them from now on more and more than ever before. And so whatever you write about it, it didn't, didn't help me anything. And then uh, I started Cardano in 2000 and, and, and I started to apply scenario thinking and other ways of dealing differently with risk management. And then I became professor, very accidental. Uh, I mean, I would never become a professor <laughs> if, <laughs> if uh, anyway, I, I won't tell you how I became a professor. But so I became a professor 
And they, at least they told me I don't have to, I was not forced to write in all these stupid papers, these, these, you know, these A papers that only want to have neoclassical people because you became a professor if you wrote into these neoclassical papers. Right? The, the rethinking economics people can, can uh, uh, tell you more about this. So this is a fundam fundamental problem, not just with the economy, but also with the education of the economy. It, it starts with the education. So everybody is educated in a stupid way. So they start to do the same thing in, in, in these banks, in, these, in the government. And so I got so angry and I didn't, I knew that, that uh, accidentally I, I made a small film with Terry Jones, who I, I mean, I loved Monty Python when I was young. That was my, those were my big heroes, still are the most funny people ever on earth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and I got friends with Terry and, and he, he saw my, uh, uh, my inaugural speech about, uh, about Minsky. And he said, wow, economics is all about human behavior and, the, and they think, it's not people are rational, people are, uh, is this how economics works? He was so surprised, so he wanted to make a documentary about it. He said, we have to make a documentary uh, about it, so credits to Terry. And, uh, and I was lucky to, uh, to have some friends uh, that sponsored the whole thing, and my own company, and myself, and uh, so that's how we... Uh, how we Very nice. Let's let's watch it. Uh, two clips. The first one I I think from South Park, but you used it for for your film as well. Yeah. <coughs> I got a hundred dollar check from my grandma, and my dad said I need to put it in the bank so it can grow over the years. Well, that's fantastic. A really smart decision, young man. We can put that check in a money market mutual fund. Then we'll reinvest the earnings into foreign currency accounts with compounding interest, and it's gone. <laughs> Uh, what? It's gone. It's all gone. What's all gone? The money in your account. It didn't do too well. It's gone. What do you mean? I, I have $100. Not anymore, you don't. Poof. Well, well, what can I do to get back I'm my... I'm sorry, sir, but this line is for bank members only. I just opened an account. Do you have any money invested with this bank? No, you just lost it all. Then please stand aside for people who actually have money with us. Next, please. So this inspired you to <laughs> to <laughs> because you selected this for the film, right? Yeah, I mean this is of course the the it's it's not a film by by the way not a bank bashing film because I think bank played a, f a role in in the whole crisis. Uh, but people, it's more human behavior how people start to become uh, overconfident and greedy and banks uh, fuel that greediness and and they help you invest in all kind of uh, stupid products and then they were um, as that they start to repackage the products. The funny thing about banks is that they, they made these very uh, very complex products called CDOs, eh, collateral de debt obligations, and they started to sell them to German pension funds and think that people who didn't understand anything about it. So this is this is debt, but then packaged together, yeah, right? So, yeah, so, so that's so also in the film. Uh, how the okay. Dick Bazemore explains it very well, how they repackage yeah. the debt, and uh, Dick so, Bazemore so is kind of Dutch Steve Keen. So, so, <laughs> so they, l they loan out money, uh, people borrow it, and then the bank has a loan as an asset on its balance yeah. sheet, and they put it together with a few hundred other loans or a few thousand yeah. other loans, and then they sell the whole package to somebody else. Yeah. Yep. So they take the risky loans, and they take them off the balance sheet, and then they show that it has very. Then it gets a credit rating, and the credit rating says very safe, because the credit rating agencies got paid by these banks, and they. Th this is really e to me. Those agencies are worse than the banks because they gave very high ratings to these products. And I even once went into, saw a, c uh, a CFO of a very large Dutch bank. Of course, I'm not going to mention his name. And I started to explain to him because uh, I used to work at that bank. I used to work at several banks in Holland. <laughs> so, <that they're laughs> so you don't know which bank it is. And he said, wow, is that really true? I never, never knew this. So, uh, but uh, we said, but the rating is so high. He said, yeah, the ra how can the rating be high? You should, on the asset side, there's garbage, 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 and on the liability side, so the, the, it's suddenly, it's safe, safe, safe. How is that possible? That's what the rating agencies did, and people believed it. So they threw it to these the pension funds, but then all these things did very well, and what did these banks do? They started to buy them back. They started to buy the equity parts and the risky parts themselves, because they thought, this is, so they asked, they became more stupid than the guys they sold it to themselves. It's amazing. So everybody gets greedy, and then they think, "Wow, this is it w the crap we're selling is really working. We have to we have to buy the crap back." 
this this happened. I mean, everybody gets greedy. Everybody gets um, blind for the things that 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 Steve saw coming. They 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 really start to believe this was a miracle. And then they said, this is this is a new new period. This is the the great moderation. We will never have crisis again. And, and yeah. do you agree with Steve's story that um, while it was going well? Um, people were taking out a lot of, of credit, so the amount of money in the economy is going, uh, growing and we were all thinking it, it, the economy is growing and it's never going to stop. But then the problem started and the amount of um, uh, loans being taken out by people were going down. Because that's what you said, right Steve? Mm -hmm. when, when people stop borrowing and pay back um, their loans, then actually the amount of money in the economy is going down. So that uh, kind of impairs the growth. Yeah, of course I agree. I mean, it's a, a simple thing. If you would have a village and you give people money, you generate money and people start to buy stuff, then, then that everybody will, will uh, produce more and will, will the whole economy is flourishing. But you are taking, uh, you're, you're borrowing uh, for the future and you have to repay it at some point. And we still have to repay everything. So that's why it's now dragging on the, on the worldwide economy. And, and China even got involved after the financial crisis in this debt level. I mean, I'm not a macroeconomist, but... The funny thing with Minsky is that Minsky was a bridge between... Minsky is a, he's an economist. Yeah, yeah. I'm a Minsky, yeah. You're, you're both fan of Min Minsky, yeah. right? Yep. You called yep. your model, that was I called... I called my software Minsky. <laughs> okay. yeah. I called my children Minsky. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. You, you could have called them Hyman, it could be worse. <laughs> and he, he was pre predicting this, this was going to happen, but nobody was listening back then. Uh, he said it did happen before, it happens every time again, and... Uh, Steve looks from it from a macroeconomic perspective. I look to the to the uh, financial economy, and I saw that in the financial economy, when these kind of things happen, that everybody becomes euphoric, and and the everybody is collectively irrational. You see the volatility there, so the, the the volatility is the and also the price of risk uh, that that's in the, the, that you can buy products to, them to insure yourself, and that price of risk what came down when the risks were getting higher and higher. So there was collective irrationality. That's totally against every economist books. They say if risks, are, if volatility is going down, then the markets are safe. And the markets got unsafer every day. Yeah, there's, that, there's just on that point, Minsky talks about what he calls euphoric expectations. So you have a period of a slump, and after the slump, everybody's conservative. Because you're conservative, banks and borrowers only put forward projects and fund projects that are conservatively estimated. But because the economy's recovered, most of those projects succeed. And people look at it and think, oh, we would have made more money if we'd borrowed more. It pays to lever. And so that over time, you go from depressed expectations to what he calls euphoric expectations. Now, that's a realistic cycle. Of course, what it means is more and more bad debts get issued. The more euphoric you get, finally, the debts, the, you know, the real reality hits. The debts don't pay off and you go into a crash, and that's the cycle that Minsky explains. I think this is a perfect bridge to the next clip that we selected from, uh, from your documentary. Okay. You can show it um, short. The banks were taking on more and more risk, investing in the financial economy instead of the real economy. The financial economy, as it's become, is essentially making money out of money instead of investing in firms and companies and contributing to the real economy. So what happened to the banks and insurance companies that got involved in the subprime lending? You can think of the, the, the end of 2007, what happened? The bank starts looking a little more carefully at their balance sheet. They look at the assets they've got and they say, wow, a lot of those assets are trash. Okay, we know that these things are bad, a high percentage of them. And um, some of our assets are the IOUs of other banks. I wonder if their balance sheets are as bad as ours. And they sort of think, you know, they probably are because we're all doing the same stuff. And then they say, you know, maybe when that loan comes due, we should call it in. Say, we're not gonna renew it anymore because we think maybe you could get in trouble and we won't get paid. Suddenly, all the banks started doing this. And basically, that is when the global credit markets froze up. Banks wouldn't lend to each other anymore. And so that turned into a massive liquidity crisis, and that is what set off the whole thing. 
So this layering of debt on debt, financial institutions owing other financial institutions, turns out to be extremely dangerous. So, Steve, you, this is also what you think has oh, happened yeah. here? Very much so. I mean, I, I focus more on the macroeconomics, as Theo, Theo said, but you also get the behavior of banks, and banks uh, have uh, a bank has to have positive equity. A bank's assets must exceed its liabilities, otherwise it's bankrupt. Now, its liabilities, a lot, lot of them are you know, deposit accounts you people have. They're not going to change rapidly unless there's a bank run. But the assets can include crap, like they purchased, as Theo was saying, uh, you know, garbage assets. When they start to get revalued, the assets plunge, the liabilities remain the same, so they lose their equity. And the classic instance of that was with Henry, Henry Paulson, who was at the time, he was Treasury Secretary. He was head of Goldman Sachs, I think, wasn't he? Yeah. Previous career. And he got a call from the, the current head of Goldman Sachs. He said, you've got to do something. We're going to go bankrupt. You're doing thing, and you've got to do it quickly. And Paulson said, how long have you got? The answer was, about three hours. <laughs> That's how fast the assets were plunging in value. And because the assets were uh, decreasing in value rapidly, uh, banks didn't trust each other anymore, so they stopped uh, lending money to yep. each other. And that is an essential thing in our financial system. Once that's gone, it's gonna, uh, not, not going to work anymore. Yeah, you know, yeah. Of course, it's it's in the end uh, the financial system is based on trust, and uh, when there's a tipping point, of course, it's not the cause of the crisis. As some people say, still, I read about Lehman was the cause of the crisis. No, it was Come the on. symptom. It was a symptom. It was the end game of the crisis. It was the tipping point, and during that tipping point, you get, yeah. Well, we're we're gonna okay, get we, to we that get back to uh, that. So yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. So, but uh, continue with your, with your story. So, yeah, at, at the end of the, the whole debt crisis, and you never know exactly uh, when, it, when it you get there. Uh, people say mm -hmm. Steve Keen uh, predicted the debt crisis. He predicted the whole process very well. He didn't say it will happen this and this day. I mean, yeah, you uh, can't get the no. timing right, but you can say it's inevitable. Yeah. 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 And you, so you can see that there are things in, 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 the, uh, in the air that most people don't see because they don't get the education. The education... Mm -hmm. I want to add something to the to the stupidity list you made mm. about the economists, and that's uh, Robert Lucas, because Robert Lucas, probably his brains are five times bigger than mine. That's not so difficult. And um, But he got a Nobel Prize, so he is a very smart person, and the uh, Nobel Prize in economics is really not a Nobel Prize. But anyway, so he got the Nobel Prize, in, I think, in 95, and in 2003 he said, we will have no um, depressions anymore, no crisis. And then a crisis occurred, and then he had to explain in The Economist why a crisis occurred. And then he, and, and the model didn't predict it. And then his answer was, this is serious, you can, you can read it. His answer was, well, we made all our models based on the assumption that crisis would not occur. <laughs> but this, this sentence is there. This sen I use it almost five times a week because that is so flabbergasting. So you go to the university, you pay a lot of money, you get a Nobel Prize winner, and he gives you a model about crisis, assuming crisis will not occur. That's genius. And, and, and this is literally what happened. And this is still what, what they teach people. And that's why these rethinking economics people, and there are several here, have to change the curriculum. Mm. Because we, if we teach this to everyone, and, and those people go and work into banks and finance and, 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 and the Ministry of Finance and the Treasurer, I mean, that, that's terrible. Yeah. So if we... Um if we go uh, take that problem, it dried up the credit from bank to bank. Is that better now? Do banks trust each other again? And is, is this, this problem solved? <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, of course, the, the problem of trust will never be solved because uh, yeah, trust is a... Uh, you can only increase trust a bit. Mm -hmm. So they increase trust a bit by uh, increasing the... Uh, reducing the leverage of the bank. So mm -hmm. increasing their amount of equity, means safety, the amount of money they have if things go wrong to protect themselves against crisis. Um, because, because that's what how banks finance this themselves, right? They have uh, partly, uh, they finance themselves by issuing shares, so that's the equity part, yeah. eh? that's what shareholders Or long-term debt as well. And a little bit of long-term debt, and then you have a lot of short-term debt, which is mostly our deposits. Yeah. So the bank deposits on your bank account are actually loans to the bank yeah. that are called so they, they, they're a liability not a not equity yeah 
And so a few things changed after the crisis, uh, also coming back to that question. Um, one of the things is that if now banks fail, not only the equity will suffer, but also the, the, the bonds that the banks have. So in the past, they, 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 you could buy a bond from a bank, uh, yeah, like a corporate bond is called, a banking bond, and you would get a few percent higher interest rate than, uh, than you would buy uh, a, uh, a government bond. But if the banks would default, they would repay because they thought, no, we're not going to touch these bonds because then the whole banking system will collapse. I think banks should bankrupt. That's one of my, my true ideas of it's ridiculous that, that central banks and regulators think banks should not bankrupt. Banks should go bank. Why, why does my bakery around the corner bankrupt and, and a bank cannot? A bank is, is, has to be saved. That's ridiculous. Not because uh, people are angry at the bankers, but also the whole system doesn't work. If you only think, oh, we have to have to save the banks, the banks have to, I mean, then the banks can take as much risk as they want because they know they get saved. Like Deutsche Bank, of course, if Deutsche Bank would be a standalone uh, bank, uh, you wouldn't invest one penny in them because it, they're totally bankrupt, but they get saved by the German government. The German government will never let them down. That's a ridiculous system. Then make it a, a state-owned bank, but not a private bank with private shareholders that cannot go bankrupt. That's a ridiculous system. And they, what they did after the crisis is they made them safer and safer so they can't fail, but they will fail at one point, but now they are get so big and so connected because every bank, bank is doing more or less the same that I think the, the, the risks of one bank going bankrupt are lower, but the systemic risk of the whole financial system collapsing at one point in time may get bigger because of all these regulations and, and bigger banks and, and even the consolidation of banks around the world. So the risk of a, of a systemic crisis is actually bigger than to a certain uh, the, the funny thing is, uh, this is a paradox, if you make on a micro level, bank by bank, you make them safer, but they all become the same uh, and they do the same kind of things and they, uh, they are, then they get more or less more connected and that can make the whole financial system um, more fragile. And we don't know it because th this is what an uh, economist has to investigate with new kind of models, with, with network theory and other things, how do these banks, uh, how do they get more or less linked to each other because of uh, same regulations, same strategies, other things, and what will it in imply when things go wrong? But that's not in the standard economics as well. So th that's a thing we have to we have to re-educate ourselves on these kind of mm. issues. But didn't didn't uh, the regulators take action after the crisis in 2008 and and listen to you, Steve? And uh, they they took action, believing the textbooks were right, even though the crisis proved they were wrong. So the first thing that Bernanke did was dramatically increase the level of reserves because he thought that's what give, would make banks safe, having huge reserves, and they should lend from the reserves, which is the textbook model. But they can't lend from reserves. It's mathematically impossible to lend from reserves unless loans are all in the form of cash. If you go to a bank and they gave you a million euro in you know, 10,100 euro notes, then reserves could go down, loans could go up. Because they reserves, don't do that. reserves are what banks, um, that's central bank reserves. Yeah. That, so that's a deposit account of, of my commercial banks, yeah. let's say uh, ING, yeah. is holding at the central bank. Yeah, and that's, they dramatically increased that and then wondered why lending didn't recover. Because that, that's what's, ha what's happening right now. The, the European Central Bank yeah. um, is right now uh, lowering interest mm. rates on, on these deposits, and they bought a lot of uh, bonds in the market. Yeah. So, so government bonds, corporate bonds, and so these bonds are not anymore in, in the markets. They're not on the balance yeah. sheet of banks, if we go and it's we go replaced, back right? Yeah, we, we go back to that wonderful South Park cartoon. It's that the regulators thought they had to rescue the banker rather than, what's the kid's name? Huh? Stan. Stan, okay. They should have rescued Stan. He was the one who was robbed. Uh, they, they blame the debtor and say it's the debtor's fault for getting in debt. But fundamentally it's the creditor creating too much credit that is actually the causal factor there. So like in Obama's case, there was a huge amount of money put aside to rescue householders. But they only rescued about a thousand. Or they rescued the banks instead and thought rescuing the banks is more important than rescuing the debtors. And what they did was what they call quantitative easing, which drastically increased the value of the assets the banks had in the financial sector in general. They let the, left the debtors out to dry. So I'd rather have what I call a modern debt jubilee. And so let's use the, 
government's capacity to create money to give everybody, whether you're a debtor or a creditor or not, give you a cash injection. If you are a debtor, your debt gets paid down. If you're not a debtor, you get money you can spend or buy shares with. And that would be rescuing the debtors rather than rescuing the creditors. Mm -hmm. And that's what used to happen in ancient societies, Sumerian civilization, Roman before the fall. Uh, that's what we should do. We should actually be rescuing the debtors, not the lenders, not the banks. Mm -hmm. Because that's exactly uh, the opposite of what, what the central bank is doing right now. Yeah. Th because they're buying all these bonds in the markets and the, that increases the bonds. The, mm -hmm. the bonds increase uh, in value, but the money doesn't go to our bank accounts. No, yeah. Hmm. And, but what you're saying is give everybody some money. That's and, and then the bankers say, well, that's not possible. It's against regulations. It's the Maastricht Treaty which prohibits this. Your, that's, that's your biggest problem is the Maastricht Treaty. <laughs> uh, I'm no fan of the Brexit debate in the UK, but the I'm a critic of the European Union and the Maastricht Treaty, and uh, that's focusing on entirely the wrong problem. I'll show you the level of government debt for the Netherlands. It's one-fifth the level of private debt. Okay, So they're obsessing about a lower indicator when the government can't... If you actually produced your own currency, you couldn't go bankrupt because the government pays, can create the money that pays back its own debt. The problem with the European the euro is you don't have your own currency anymore. So the whole design, I think, is fallacious, and that's a major reason why Europe is relatively depressed right now, and Germany in particular. So, ag again, it's bad theories and bad ideas from economists that politicians swallow because that's what the economists teach them, saying that government should be like a household and should save money. But when they do that, what the government does to save is tax you more than it spends on you, meaning it takes money out of your bank accounts, which means one of two things. Either you spend less, so the economy goes down, or you go and borrow money from banks and speculate on house prices and you get a housing bubble. So the driving force behind the Maastricht Treaty is another wrong way of thinking about the economy. And, and that's what we adhere to, to those rules, but you're saying it's the wrong rules. Mm, yeah. Hmm. So you, you, we show this piece of the film where you saw that money didn't doesn't go into the real economy, but it goes into financial assets, mm -hmm. and that's still happening. Uh, after the financial crisis, uh, the mo the money uh, the only thing they did was quantitative easing, and it went into asset uh, to stock markets going up, and house prices going up worldwide. It's still uh, it's still happening. So nothing is solved uh, as it comes to the the real economy. But what the central bank says is, well, we, we decrease the interest rate and then people will borrow more money. And so you, you always say... <laughs> That's one <laughs> that of those assumptions. The yeah, they, yeah. They, they say we, in, we reduce interest rates so um, people will save less. You know what people did? They, they reduced interest rates and people thought, shit, when I want to have my retirement money, I have to put even more money in so I have to save more. These assumptions that all these assumptions economists make are so often wrong to stop making all these assumptions. I mean, it's just risky. I don't know how the world works, but it, it sometimes you have a policy instrument and it works totally counterproductive and they always assume things. They, they assume everything. But right now, it's it, the ECB is doing this for quite a while. Um, other central banks are doing this as well. Is there nobody at the... Why aren't you guys working at the central bank? Uh, they I don't like I know, us. I know. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> We have an attitude problem, I think, first of all. <laughs> I showed a film, the film Boom Was Boom at the ECB. There were 400 people in the room. And then afterwards we had drinks and people, when they drink, they talk more. And they start to talk about how annoyed they were about the policies at the ECB and, and everything that happened. And they fully agreed with the film and that there was no solution in, in this quantitative easing, but it was all political. And that's, that's, they were really, really annoyed, their own staff. So who's who's deciding this? How come <laughs> how well come everybody knows this? It, it's 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 it, that's a good question, and, and it's it's partly people are committed to a set of rules, and even though they're crazy, they're still the rules. So unless you're willing to go and break the rules, which is a criminal offence, so what happens is you keep on doing this stuff even though it's stupid, and now what you're seeing is Draghi is coming out and saying, we can't stimulate the economy anymore with the monetary policy, we've got to hand to the fiscal authorities. And what do the fiscal authorities say? We're stuck with the Maastricht Treaty. We can't run large deficits. In fact, we're encouraged, like in France, yeah. we're being penalised by running a deficit. 
So you've got these crazy rules and ultimately what happens is breakdown. I'm hoping Italy will leave the euro mm. or establish a parallel currency which breaks the euro. Because that's the only way allowed us to break way. You've got to break the rules. So and bureaucrats are not known for breaking rules. So all these rules in the Maastricht Treaty are not, we're not, um, if, we, if we stick to the rules, the economy is, is, is going to go wrong. Yeah, it's not going to recover. Even Germany's in a recession now. I mean, Germany benefited from the euro because it had, you know, it's, it's the mark would be valued a lot more than the euro if the mark still existed compared to the lira. So suddenly, because Germany has lower inflation than Italy, German cars get cheaper every year compared to Italian cars. So what happens is people start buying more German cars than Italian cars. And Germany used to, Italy used to be able to get out of that by devaluing the lira, only it can't anymore. So that was biased in favour of particularly Germany, but most of the northern European countries. And even given that, Germany is now in recession. Do we have another question from the audience? Over here. Yes, my name is Ian. Uh, I have two questions, uh, a quick one. I, I ask one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> just two. Uh, first, if, uh, is uh, one of the solutions is uh, to break the big banks into smaller banks, like before in the 70s, you have the, all these small banks which can go bankrupt without any problems. So that's the first question. And the second thing is, should the Netherlands leave the euro to resolve uh, what you just now mentioned? So it's big banks to small banks and euro to national currencies. Okay. I'm in favour of small banks for the simple reason that banks actually, when they're small, they tend to be regional and they make decisions based on what they know about their customers. So I've got a personal example of that. Um, one of my sisters has been a very successful business person in part of Australia, and when she applied for a loan to start a, a big business, the bank wouldn't give it to her because she didn't get a decent credit score. But if the, the, because the, the credit score was made in the, the capital city a thousand kilometres away. They didn't know whether she was a business person or a, or a marsupial. You know, they had no knowledge. Um, so I lent them the money for it, let the business start, and the business is now making quite a successful amount of money. But that, that if the bank had known what she was, if the bank was local, they would have said, she's a successful business person, it looks like a good idea, we'll take a risk. There would have been twice as big a business, twice the revenue, and it would have been an effective economy. So localised banks making localised decisions make much more sense than the centralised monsters we've allowed to be created. Yeah, I would like to add to that the uh, the uh, film uh, "It's a Beautiful Life" by uh, James Stewart was playing every year. They 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 replay this film in, uh, in Christmas United time. At Christmas time, mm. I learned that from Larry Kotlikoff because Larry Kotlikoff, um, who was also in the film, he he wrote a book and he said Jimmy Stewart is dead, and that was about the Jimmy Stewart in that film, and that film is about local small banks. And, and there are people uh, who want to take over the banks and they want to uh, put more credit into the system. And then and they say to the to local people, oh, don't trust your bank. And so there's a run on the bank. And then uh, Jimmy Stewart, he, he as, the, as an actor, then he had another name in the film, but he, he talks to all the local people and he knows them well. And then there is no bank run anymore. So the banks are much more uh, yeah, local and stable. And a local bank that, that defaults it happens all the time in the United States, uh, small banks, and there's never a problem. But big, ba big banks cannot default. That's ridiculous. Local banks that default, the depositors get the money back, usually it gets reorganized, the equity holders are gone, the, the corporate bonds are gone, and, and everybody is, is happy. It's just a, a normal ecosystem. But a system with huge international bank is not a normal ecosystem. It's just a, a very fragile system. So I totally agree. Yeah. Okay. And on the, on the currency, I'd, I'd prefer to go back to national currencies. But the, we, all like, we all find the euro easy. You know, you hop on a plane and, and ship oil, land in Paris, pull out your euro, you go shopping. It's convenient. That's really seductive for all of us. And if you want to, if you actually had the old days, you have to take your, your um, what did you guys use in the old days, Mark? Gilders. Gilda, take a Gilda, convert on. it to francs. You'd pay a, a huge, you know, you'd have to be gouged by the person you made the transfer with, made it inconvenient, you didn't like it. I would like to go back to national currency to say, let's make the central banks handle that cost of trans transactions at no cost to the individuals. So you get 100% of the value of your guilders reflect in francs. That gives you the convenience, and then you can use the euro as it used to be, the European currency unit, for international trade. Something like that would work much more effectively. Okay, we have another question here. 
how long can quantity quantitative easing go on? Uh, and if you think, um, well, it, it, it can't go on forever, um, what would be the policy that should be put in place then? So quantitative easing, the buying of bonds by the central bank yeah. from the balance sheets of, of regular banks. Yeah, that's just inflated financial assets, so particularly in America. America is such a huge economy, you can use it as a, a test case. It gets more muddied with smaller economies, uh, or, uh, but that's the best one. So when they started doing quantitative easing, the American central bank was buying $80 billion worth of bonds off the financial sector every month. That's pretty much a trillion dollars a year. Now, where did they get the money from? They invented it. They simply said, we're going to put a trillion dollars in the bank accounts of the financial sector, and they're going to give us a trillion dollars worth of pieces of paper, their bonds. And they did it every year for 10 years. Nobody paid any tax for it, okay? There was no tax to finance quantitative easing. It was just a monetary operation. The same thing could be done with people's quantitative easing. Monetary operation, put an injection to everybody's bank accounts per capita basis so it overcomes the massive increase in inequality that QE itself caused because when they started doing that, the S&P, and I love this, we should get another thunderclap when I make this number, uh, the S&P the S had fallen to 666 points, mark of the devil. It's now at about 2,500. That all has been driven by this QE because when you buy a trillion dollars worth of bonds off the financial sector, that means the financial sector's bonds holding go down by a, thousand, by a trillion, its cash goes up by a trillion. They can't make money out of cash, so they've got to buy assets with that trillion dollars. What do they buy? They buy shares. That drives up share prices. That makes the people who own shares wealthier, and a bit of that money dribbles into the real economy because some of the financial agents will buy a Lamborghini or two and hire somebody to wash the Lamborghini and you get a, you get a, a bit of a, a, a spill over into the real economy. So it does a, a terribly small stimulus, but it still does. Well, that's what's been holding up the global economy for the last 10 years. Now, instead, what they should be doing is saying, let's reduce the private debt level. Use people's quantitative easing. So anybody who's got debt has to reduce their debt. Anybody who doesn't have debt and didn't speculate gets an increase in cash. You could say that money should be used to buy new shares corporate shares, which would cancel corporate debt and also democratise the ownership of shares. So we could go about it in a way that reversed the inequality, stimulated the economy as well. It's quite feasible to do that. But, and this, there's no rule against this. Okay? It's just the opposition of conservative economists and politicians to taking action like that, which benefits the public rather than benefiting the banks. So, Steve, this is what you would like, and I, I agree with it, that this is much more effective than quantitative easing, but the question was how long can it go on? In forever. It can go on forever, that's the point. Uh, and, and then we get stuck in the drag that yeah. we are now. Do, do there's there's what no what limit. Will be the effect? Huh? What will be the effect if we, if we continue QE? Because the, the more, more the inequality ECB is going to restart, right? They announced we're going to buy yeah. again. Yeah. More, more inequality, no effect on the real economy, more in financial assets, and, and, and financial assets go to the wrong people. Uh, lower interest rate than they would be. We don't know what the interest rate would be without quantitative easing, but it's quite clear now that, that uh, lots of companies, big companies, are financing themselves with very cheap money, and they might be very inefficient, and, and, and new companies would normally appear, but now they, they, the inefficient companies can still survive. And, yeah, and that's so that, that's, it's not functioning, the economy is not because functioning. Because they're buying only the bonds of large companies, corporates yeah. and governments, right? Because small companies don't issue bonds. Can't they have to go the to market. the bank. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they, have, they have trouble getting to the banks because banks have higher uh, regulatory demands. So they have to, to increase their, uh, their equity. So they have to uh, lend less money to, to uh, for example, the, the uh, small and medium enterprises. So they suffer and the big companies get f very cheap access. I mean, it's not a conspiracy theory. This is just an accidental thing that happens because of all this quantitative easing. And um, what's the effect of, of this uh, negative interest rate on, uh, say, the pension funds and the, the savers, regular savers? Well, actually, the interest rates are going down uh, for 30 years now or, or longer uh, worldwide. And I don't know what the effect is of, of exactly of the uh, monetary authorities on the interest rate, because uh, I wouldn't know if they didn't have anything, if the interest rate would be half a percent higher or one percent higher. 
Um, but the point is that there is a totally different society now because of many different reasons. We have companies that, that don't issue IPOs anymore. They have so much money. All, all the top 10 Googles and et cetera of this world have so much capital and so much cash that they don't have to, uh, they don't need to borrow money. Sometimes they do, but then they lend it out directly. Um, so there is less capital demand. There is a lot of saving in the world because of, of demographic shifts and, and, and people getting older, people want to save more for the pension. So there's a huge amount of extra savings in the world. There's less demand for money. So there is some kind of a natural interest rate, but we don't know what it is because the, the monetary authorities are interfering all the time. So, But the point is we have a lower interest rate and everybody has to, when, when you want to prepare for your old age, this is one of my hobbies, then uh, you have to adjust yourself and and be prepared that, that you might go for a, for a longer period of either quantitative easing helps you with the asset inflation or nothing will happen and, and, and there will be very low returns in the long term. And then we have to work longer, which is the topic of my next film, by the way, uh, <laughs> Your 100 Year Life. And it's about that it's good to work longer. We all have to work longer, but then in different jobs, in different, uh, we have to find our passion where, where, when we get older, where do we need to work? And, and that's something you cannot solve by having, for example, another discount rate, which are people proposing now in the Netherlands that will solve all our problems. Calculating differently will not solve our pension problem. We are in a different situation than we were 30 years ago, when I started working, interest rates were 9%. On the long, long, run, long term interest rate, 30 year interest rates were 9%. I mean, that's a different world. We live in a different world now. So we have to adjust also with our, our human capital. Yeah, I, I made the comment about three years ago that quantitative easing was like a pact with the devil. You know, once you sign a document with Mephistopheles, you can't decide to withdraw from the contract later. So each time they do QE and they try to get out of it, the process that drove share prices up works in reverse. If they try to buy, sell the bonds back to the financial sector, then the financial sector has to sell shares to buy those bonds. And when they sell the shares, the share price plunge, and they go, the regulars go, oh dear, share prices are falling. Can't have that back to QE again. But that started in, I think, in 95 already with Greenspan or in the 90s. When yeah, Greenspan they call it 87, the Greenspan yeah. put. It's a Greenspan put when he, yeah, in 87, he started for the first time. Mm. To Greenspan to was the, the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of uh, uh, America. America yeah. Right? Yeah. He has a very nice role in this film. He's, a, he's a, one of the key players because he, he, he tells everyone that he has an ideology and the ideology didn't work. And uh, then he apologizes a little bit, but then uh, that's the only funny part of Cookman in that film, because he said, and then Greenspan just continued to mm. uh, to make all kind of statements with uh, impeccable wrongness. But uh, yeah, Greenspan. So Greenspan, every time there was a crisis, Greenspan would reduce interest rates, and uh, of course, at some point, and and that would help the the financial economy, not the real economy, but the financial economy. So since the ninety since the 1990s or 87, the, the financial markets are going up and people are borrowing more because they feel confident. Some people borrow to buy, to buy stocks, some people borrow to buy houses, not to in improve the economy, really. And, uh, and, that, and every time there was a crisis, they reduced interest rates. At some point, interest rates couldn't get lower. And then they started quantitative easing. It's just uh, but it started mm. in the 87, yeah. yeah. And negative so. interest rates, is that plausible? Because it would be great to take out a loan uh, for a new house well, it's and get money from the bank. It's actually happening in Denmark. You've now got negative mortgage rates, which is yeah. crazy. Um, but the, the main negative rates are applied on reserves. So the banks have a, accounts at the central bank, and they used to be paid positive interest for that. And what they're doing is they're putting imposing negative rates there. And they have this theory that if you're getting a negative rate for reserves, it's better to lend money out. So you should shift loans from reserves to loans. And that'll stimulate lending, give us more private debt. That's the theory. It hasn't worked because they can't lend reserves in the first place. So you, you get, you've, got a, you've got a wizard in charge, wizard casting spells when they doesn't, he doesn't understand magic. Mm. And that's what I see as the real problem. So can I say then lay in? Yeah. We, we have another oh, question. Yeah, yeah. You, you continue. I'll, I'll, I'll go there. So I, I would, if I would say what's happening there in, in, in uh, layman terms is that they, if they lend money, the banks, they have money, but they have to put it somewhere. So they put it at the central bank at minus one. Mm. And then they think, yeah, pff, I can better give it to a mortgage, uh, lend it out as a mortgage mm. for minus half. And people think, why don't you, if, if you have, why should you want to pay 
for um, for a mortgage that you lend to somebody else as a bank, but but they pay for it, but they pay less than they had to pay as a punishment at central bank. So money has be, capital has become toxic. It's mm. toxic. You have to park capital somewhere for a price. So it has a. Somebody said last week to me, actually, it's a kind of a parking price. You have to like parking your car for a. Uh, for a certain price. Mm. Now you have to park it at the central bank for minus one or minus two maybe in the future. So we have to rethink what interest rates mean. It's not like a, a capital shortage. Maybe it's a capital, uh, a toxic capital you have to put somewhere. Yeah. Hi. Uh, sh yeah, okay. Uh, my name is Lotte. Uh, just for clarification, you just mentioned that if we would, instead of kind of bail bailing out the banks we or quantitative easing, we would give the money to all, all the people. Um, but you also mentioned that people usually don't invest it, but usually put it in things that don't give any money back to the economy, or put so in housing or in or in consumption. Consumption. So how would that stimulate the economy in a crisis? I, I think it depends a little bit on uh, if you give. That's a problem with uh, inequality. That the richer people get more money now, and and the, and the poorer people get less money. Richer people won't spend it. If you give a rich person. If you give Bill Gates thousand, well, he will probably spend it on a malaria net or something. But uh, other people won't spend it. They will. But if you give poor people money, they will spend it tremendously in in the real economy. That's I think your assumption as well. Just quick, mm -hmm. yeah. Just because we don't know for sure, of course. Yeah, because the graph you showed showed that uh, if you have a lot of uh, uh, if you have debt kind of by companies, it has a. Uh, less of an effect on, or uh, less of a risk of, of uh, than yeah. housing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So is that is it just that people spend it on other things? Uh, I, I'd w what we've had is we, there's two ways you can spend. You can earn money mm -hmm. and spend it, and that turns over existing money. So that's why the, the amount of money in existence times well often it turns over. Mm -hmm. Or you can borrow money, credit. Uh, because we have such a high level of private debt. People are now spending the money they've got more slowly. So if you look at the rate at which money turns over in America, it used to be roughly twice a year. So if you had, say, a billion, a trillion dollars in money, you turned over twice a year, got two trillion dollars of GDP. That boomed to about three and a half times with high inflation in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, but it's now fallen to about 1.3. So with a trillion dollars of money, you're only getting $1.3 trillion of GDP. And my feeling about why that's happening is people carrying the amount of debt we're carrying, we all think, oh, I don't want to, I want to save money. But when you save money as an individual, you don't create more money, you simply slow down how fast it turns over. So if we could reduce the debt levels, people would be less worried about having to service their debt, spend more rapidly, you get more turnover of existing money and more income out of that. So a major thing is reduce that private debt level. That's the worst symptom we have in capitalism. So Steve, there's, there's actually too much money in the economy, but it's, it's standing at places. It's not circulating. Yeah, we, we, have a, we, we don't have enough big money being created by the government, in fact. When the government spends, uh, it creates money. When it taxes, it destroys money. Because of the obsession, particularly in Europe, about running a balanced budget or actually running a surplus, the government's actually either not creating enough money or destroying it. So in that situation, we go and borrow money from the banks. But when you borrow money from banks, as well as getting money, you get an identical amount of debt. And that doesn't increase your situation. What you then do is you think, oh, I, I want to make money by buying property. We gamble on property and we price property in a crazy way, shares the same thing. We price houses at whatever the last house sold for in our street times all the houses in the street. Now, if all the houses in the street tried to sell at once, the price would crash. It's, an it's, a, it's a fictional price. But we do that and we think we've, got, we've improved our equity by being on a rising price. We get caught in asset bubbles, but the asset bubble only keeps on going as long as people are borrowing money. Then it plunges. You have these booms and busts in asset prices. So it's all driven by un not understanding how money is created and not understanding that the government is the only institution which can actually afford to not save. The government, if the government creates its own currency, it can c continue servicing that debt indefinitely. And that's why one of the reasons I'm so opposed to the euro. So if you have run a deficit, you can finance it because you pay it with the money you create using your central bank. I'll, I'll give one, America's 120 years of data we have for America of its deficit. And its deficit over 120 years has been 2.4% of GDP. And it's sustained it, even with all the ups and downs and craziness, 
there's no problem with the government running a deficit. So by, by having the wrong argument saying the government should run a surplus, that's a major reason why we're in the problems we are today. One more question here. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Guy Pallard. I work as a supervisor for the Authority of Financial Markets. Um, I think we heard tonight some really good proposals how to improve, I think, uh, economic models, uh, also to improve uh, education. Mm. But uh, as you mentioned yourself, to truly change the system, I think we need to convince also politics. And politics only will act when voters want to change. Mm. How do we convince a broad public from these quite complicated uh, topics uh, that real change is necessary uh, and to convince them in this way? Thank you. <laughs> Any more movies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe movies can help. Uh, it, it's I really difficult. It, 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 my feeling is, like, we all talk about sunrise and sunset, but I hope nobody in the room believes that the sun actually circles around the earth anymore, okay? We just have this phraseology from 2,000 years ago. It took the astronomers 500 years ago proving to us that the earth is not the centre of the universe, the sun is, we orbit the sun, we all understand that now, but it took that deep level of, of, of research and understanding the system before we could all accept that, even though we use the old language. With, with the trouble with economics, and I know this from all the work I've done and dealing with people over the last couple of decades, most people couldn't give a shit about the economy, okay? They just wanted to work. I'm about that like a car. If I hop in a car, I couldn't give a shit about the engine, but I do if the engine breaks down. So only when you have a breakdown do people actually say, what's gone wrong? Why isn't this working? And only in those circumstances can you change it while you have a profession which doesn't understand the car in the first place. And so economists not understanding how the economy itself operates, they're the main problem. And if we had economists understanding how money actually works, understanding the interaction between the economy and the ecology, which they totally misunderstand, we'd have a realistic situation. So my ultimate blame in this factor is the economics profession. I totally and agree. If we ever want to change anything, it has to start with education. Mm. And education starts at, at high school already with, with, with all kind of make-believe stories about how the economy works, and, and it doesn't work that way. And, uh, and if we continue to, to ignore human behavior and, and ecological things and, and, and the complexity of the, uh, the economy, um, and we don't change our education, then the yeah nobody will. I mean, people at home will never understand it. But if the economist have an, uh, they look at the economy as if it is a car that works this way, and if you do this, then that happened. But it doesn't happen, and they have these assumptions, and they have to be become more humble. And that's why I really appreciate uh, rethinking economics, and 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 all these people who start to re-educate. Um, but I, I would like to mention what I said to Thomas before that when I made this film at the Vue. Uh, some professors walked out of the uh, out of the audience because they got angry about boom bus boom because they said this film will make students uncomfortable, and they send <laughs> they send a letter to the rector to uh, they complain about it and probably they want to have me fired which was uh, I can imagine but for different reasons but uh, <laughs> but not for this film but that, then they uh, the rector said uh, well people feeling uncomfortable is the essence of science but the science of economics is not a debate it's just some kind of an ideology. And, and we continue to, to, uh, to use that ideology. It's not, an, it's not an ideology or some kind of a uh, conspiracy that people were sitting together and said, we're going to, like a kind of a, a, a Roman church, we're going to do this to society, we're going to do that. That, that. It just emerged from, from, from because the, the, the uh, let's say, the, the what I always call the, the Descartian belief in the world. We can calculate everything based on a mathematical simple model. We use simple assumptions, we can make simple models, and that got deeply ingrained in our education. And if that education doesn't change, then, um, yeah, we, this we will never change. change. Okay, one more question here. Um, I think most of these problems we discuss now are related to our addiction to the simple story of eternal GDP growth. Do you, um, wha what is your opinion about moving to another indicator? Uh, I totally agree that, that why why is growth so important in itself? I mean, we have uh, we have so much uh, uh, welfare after um, this is all, of course, a whole totally different topic, but an interesting topic. But we have six times more welfare than after the World War. But people are more complaining, more stressed, more overloaded with work, 
not relaxed at all. They only, if, if you take them 1% away from their retirement income, which is the highest in the world, they, they panic. Uh, I mean, we live in a, in a, a stressed society and we only focus on growth. And it doesn't help the world, it doesn't help the, the planet. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's all, this is another focus of economists to GDP has to grow. I mean, populations are shrinking in the world, be GDP per, per head maybe, but even then, th th is it important? There is a deflation in all kinds of products we buy and material like, like all electronics are, are very deflationary. So we don't need all this money. So I, I don't understand the focus, but that's part of the ideology. Yeah, I'm going to be, this is be the most depressing thing I would have said all night. Um, I think we've, we're drastically overstraining the planet. We've gone well past its carrying capacity. And we're probably using, there's a measure called the human ecological footprint, which I recommend taking a look at, that tries to quantify the load we're putting on the planet compared, compared to how the planet can reproduce <coughs> itself over time. And that currently says we're using about 1.6 planets a year. Well, bad news, we haven't got 1.6 planets. And what that means is the ecology is going to, it will break down at some point. So we're going to be forced to go into negative growth for some time. In that situation, the only fair thing is to share the energy that we're actually, that's what we benefit from. We, the reason we have the wealth we have isn't labor, it's machinery and it's the energy machinery turns into useful work. That's my measure of g GDP. Uh, we've gone far past what we can continue exploiting in terms of energy in this biosphere and when it collapses and it will collapse the only way to cope is to be as fair as possible in the distribution of access to energy now that ain't going to happen it's going to be ugly but i think yes the obsession with gdp growth and the belief it can go on forever that is another failing of textbook economics and i read this garbage by people like nordhaus and it's truly garbage the fact that you got a nobel prize is a reason to shut the nobel prize down okay and that applies to many other Nobel Prize winning exactly. economists as well. I can give a few names. <laughs> so that stuff is completely devoid of any link with the r for real world. They, they have models where GDP growth continues so that you double the size of the economy every 30 years. We double and double and double and double and double. You're up to 60 times the sky, the amount of... Th we don't have 60 planets. So they have a complete lack of engagement with the physical world, and yet they're the ones who tell us how to run it. So we cannot continue having this GDP growth. We have to go seriously negative for a while. And that is not going to be a peaceful experience. So you, your, your measure would be more to, to go from 1.6 times the planet to, to, to lower that to, towards we, one. That's 1 1.6 times planets being used by humans and, their and the species we depend upon. That's ignoring the wild world. Okay? That, that's how much we've overloaded this planet. I think you wanted to read a decent thing on the planet, read a book that most economists disparage called The Limits to Growth. Hmm. And if we'd followed that 50 years ago, we wouldn't necessarily have a crisis. Economists, particularly Nordhaus, trashed that book, not understanding the logic behind it, and said, let's keep on going for growth, growth, growth. And they've now pushed it to the stage where we're straining the planet. We're now seeing, in, in weather dynamics, we're seeing, you know, in, in our daily life, we're seeing symptoms of the level of energy that we're trapping in the environment that's causing the climate to change radically in ways economists do not understand so they again economics has been the major problem okay. was that the group we, of we rome have, in the we 1970s? have one more question yeah. here uh, Theo. hi uh so my question is about uh the alternatives you propose so we've said that uh the current model with double entering uh book n book Bookkeeping, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, causes crisis, and as Missy said, the financial system is inherently unstable. But on the other hand, we do need credits uh, to have uh, elasticity in the economy. So, what's the alternative there to banks producing cash? Oh, you, you no. I'd actually have more government money creation, uh, but I'd also have. I'd rather go to the small banks, where small banks create money for local entrepreneurs. Uh, rather than the large banks, which create which create money for financial speculators, so if, if I uh, leaving aside the ecological thing, my ideal banking sector would have a, a large amount of government money creation, which would fund infrastructure, education. Education should be free. Um, the, the the damage that's been done to education by making it something that's chargeable in the UK is appalling. So having a system like the Netherlands, where you don't pay for university education, that's a sensible way for the government to create money infrastructure and things like that as well um, but 
I want private, you, you need to have private people making decisions about taking a risk. Because uh, bureaucrats hate taking a risk. Bureaucrats hate making a mistake. And therefore, the, the, the bigger the organisation, the more bureaucratic, the, more, the less risk taking. And you need people to take risks to create money for entrepreneurs with good ideas. So I'd go for a combination, a mixed system, but where the private banks could only make money by creating it for entrepreneurs and businesses rather than for speculative bubbles. Okay, we have the last question here. Um, so my name is Lucia and I was really curious about um, what the effects could be of artificial intelligence in the future of economics. And maybe it's far away, maybe it's not that far away, but I was really thinking about what your thoughts were on that. <laughs> we need some real intelligence first. Um, the, the artificial intelligence has one great advantage in that it doesn't have an ego yet. Um, so without an ego, if you throw the right data at it, then it can find patterns and understand the dynamics. The real problem is what do you feed the artificial intelligence with? And like I, I, wor I, I work with people who design what are called neural networks. So I'm quite familiar with the data, uh, with, the, with the technology. And if, you, if I was feeding the neural networks, I'd be including level of credit and private debt. Now, if you gave it to a neoclassical economist, they wouldn't feed that in. So the neural network would fit itself to data that did include what I regard as the major causal factor. So even though AI does help, you have to have genuine intelligence to decide what you actually feed the AI that it then learns its patterns on. And at the moment, we don't have that. But certainly, uh, black box technology... I've had two students do PhDs on neural networks, and uh, one of them uh, was doing very nicely, thank you very much, using neural networks to successfully trade currency markets. So it, it, it does work, but you've got to have sensible intelligence in the first place because give it to a neoclassical economist and they'd get a, they'd get a neural network about as stupid as them. <laughs> I would like to add that some people, if, if you look at from the perspective of financial stability, um, for example, this, this um, that artificial intelligence can help people uh, run currency markets, but what they do is they find they find the euphoria in, in currency markets and uh, some kind of uh, behavior in these markets, mm -hmm. and they, they ride the ride, so they jump on this, uh, on this trend, and they make the trend bigger. So I'm not saying that's wrong or right, the only thing I'm saying is that it doesn't mean that artificial intelligence will make the world more stable, because uh, lots of people do things that they start to think, oh, these people are doing these kind of things, and these people have these... Uh, trading systems and these people have these artificial intelligence boxes so we're going to anticipate that and we're going to do the same thing because they're going to write that boom so we're going to make the boom bigger because if we can profit from the boom so it might be that artificial intelligence will make the world more unstable and i'll give you just one example of that this is a bit of personal knowledge i was uh, being asked by a major speculator to become his chief economic advisor and he ran the world's major what are called um, high frequency trading companies and he was explaining what they were doing in technology. And I knew that like high frequency trading companies sit right next to the stock exchange and they've got fiber, fiber, optical fiber links going straight into them to they get the data and they basically front run all the other share traders. And he then said, we're changing across to radio technology. And I didn't <coughs> react. And one of the other people looking at me realized that I didn't understand why that mattered. And he then said, the speed of light in air is, is faster than in glass. I went, and that makes a difference, and we're talking 10 metres. But that's the level of speculation that's been built in by this sort of artificial intelligence, which will actually probably amplify the cycles we're trying to tame rather than reduce them. Okay, thank you both. Um, so we're going to uh, uh, end, end the discussion because uh, we can go on for hours, I'm sure, but um, we're already past uh, uh, half past 10. Um, so I have uh, one last question. Coming back to can we avoid another crisis? We al already mentioned a few solutions, like the debt jubilee, giving everybody money, paying off debt with that. Is there anything? And, and education, of course, is is the main thing. But um, is there anything else that we can do to avoid this crisis, or what should happen after the next crisis? Yeah, what disappointed me after this crisis is that we got. We made all kind of things that, uh, so you look at symptoms, like, uh, oh, the banks had trading desks. The trading desks are risky. 
So they stopped the trading desk. So the trading desk of the banks more or less disappeared. They got they reduced by by seventy percent. Well, maybe that sounds good from a perspective of oh, the bank will not default. But trading desks, for example, this is just an example, are an important part in the ecology of asset markets. So if you have asset markets and people are trading, uh, people at home and, 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 and big pension funds, then the trading desks of these banks are a kind of um, what we would call in Holland uiterwaarde, where if, if there is too much liquidity or too little, then uh, money, then they have a role in, in liquidity in, the, in those markets. So the ecological system changed by not having these these parts of liquidity in the markets anymore and uh, they got to central clearing platforms where all the derivatives which were part of the credit uh, derivatives were part of the the, the trouble and um, but creating suddenly they created three four big uh, markets for every derivative in the world these central clearing platforms are run by banks and then they say now it's safer because we have central clearing platforms everything is centralized Everything that's centralized at some point will fail, in my opinion, if you look at it from a, from a different kind of perspective, uh, in, uh, let's say from complexity perspective, and, and that, that links a lot to ecolo ecological modeling. And what happened already is that there was a, um, a small trader in, in Norway, and he, he made a little bit of a mess with his own portfolio. And suddenly one of the NASDAQ platforms, the central clearing platforms, lost 70% of the money, and they don't even know where the money went. So what we're doing is we, we think every time we have to regulate more and more and more, but we don't even know what we're doing. Inst I, I think that we get too much regulations. We regulate the whole ecosystem into a very homogeneous a simple system and that system becomes very fragile it's the same with nature if you only have a few uh, animals in nature uh, and and these animals uh, one of them there's a, a kind of a disease that kills these animals then we're all dead and that's what we're doing now we try to make it safer but in the end it feels to me because it's only from one ideology we can control it's all simple like a car when we do this that's what happened and that's not how it works and so we Kay. Make it less so safe. We should, I, I might say I'm going to contradict here to some extent, but yeah. that's uh, at last. Okay, not really. Okay. Okay. Now we get the discussion, okay. and that <laughs> is that um, when you, we talk about deregulation, uh, <laughs> what that really meant was deregulating the financial sector, and what the financial sector does. It's it's easy to make money by selling loans for bricks and mortar, for mortgages. You don't have to be a genius to say that area is rising in price. Let's finance mortgages in that spot. You get dumb bankers making huge amounts of money. And that was really what's been the problem. And given those dumb bankers, what they really sell is debt. So what we've had is a doubling and trebling of the level of debt. It's about three times as high as it should be. And the financial sector is at least three times as big as it should be. I want to cut it back to what it was in the 50s and 60s, one third, one quarter of the current size. And that's what you've got to keep under control. Uh, finance, Marx actually put it beautifully a century ago or more. And he talked about the roving cavaliers of credit. And he said, and this gang knows nothing about the real economy and should have nothing to do with it. And Marx was right on that front. We should keep the financial sector tame to make it the servant of capitalism rather than what it's become, which is the master. Okay, great. But I, I think uh, we, we I agree with this, but, but that, that's, it, that's another point that, that you make a very homogeneous ecosystem yeah. where everything gets risky. Yeah, yeah. So, so we should diversify, make things smaller again, and then not over-regulate the few big players that can't... You don't need to over the small ones. Yeah. Okay. You, you, what you do is stop them financing speculation, hmm. getting the finance, working capital and entrepreneurs. Okay. That's what matters. Yeah. So, Theo, you're working on a new movie. What is it about, just in, in, in two sentences? It's about uh, that we get... Uh, everyone across the world gets older and that go that has gone quite rapidly. Even in Africa, people think uh, that's young... Uh, uh, continent but it's not it's got it's they, they uh, grow older fast and everywhere in the world we see people struggling with how to get older and how to deal with an old age life and we have to rethink retirement totally and we have to rethink how we at some point in our lives start to re-educate ourselves i had to go to school when i was 16 and i hated it i wouldn't have done it if it wasn't mandatory unfortunately i did it because i learned a little bit but uh I think we have to go to school at some point when we are 50 and, and re-educate ourselves. But we, we give a lot of examples in this film how people in Japan coped with longevity, how elderly people are working, entrepreneurships, uh, different jobs. And that's the world we, we're going towards. And 
Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Very good. This is part of it, yes. Uh, S Steve, you yeah. moved to the Netherlands. You finance your um, your research through Patreon, a crowd yeah. crowdfunding platform. Yep, the crowdfunding platform that's both letting me um, finance myself, no longer being an academic. And what yeah. are you researching right now? I'm working on climate change, the economics of climate change. And I hate to say it, the title of my next book is going to be The Economics of Extinction. Okay. I think we seriously have to overthrow the economists because they've, they've literally, in defending what they see as capitalism, they're destroying not just capitalism, but human civilization as well. And we've got to stop them. Okay. I need your help. Well, I think that's a, that's a great uh, <laughs> line to end the evening on. Um, so if you want to, yeah, applause for these two people. Thank you both. Thanks a lot. So if you want to donate something uh, to Pakas Zwerger, you can do that online. And um, I also uh, wrote an article uh, about what uh, we discussed uh, tonight, uh, an interview with uh, Steve Keen. You can uh, read that on Follow the Money. And there's a lot of other uh, topics that we discussed here as well. And um, I, I wrote about you as well, yes. And, uh, <laughs> support, the support the students doing rethinking <laughs> economics as well. So we've yeah. got to change, they've got to get, rid of, get, get a decent set of professors and they're not <laughs> going to come from the current crop. So thank you very much for coming here and uh, there's drinks downstairs. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>